question before, uh, before I forget. I don't want to forget these. Uh, again, pray for Pastor and Ms. Lewis as they're up in Washington for the next couple of weeks. Let's make sure we're praying for them. Uh, but uh, Brother Jerry Bass, uh, who normally comes on Sunday mornings, uh, on Friday he had a fall at Walmart, and he ended up breaking his hip. And so um, he had surgery Friday night, and uh, they did a full hip replacement. And um, so I saw him Saturday morning, first thing, and he was doing well. He was doing okay. Uh, but let's just pray for Brother Jerry as he's going to have quite a road of recovery uh, ahead. They said he's probably going to be in a walker for the rest of his life uh, just because of the, uh, the injury. Um, what had happened is he actually fell before, and they think he broke it um, on the first fall. He then got in his truck, drove to Walmart, and fell again. And, uh, and they think the second fall was because his hip was already broken. So uh, quite a man to uh, drive to the next place and then walk around Walmart of all places on a broken hip. Uh, uh, but he did get that replaced. So let's just pray for Brother Jerry, especially over the next couple of weeks as he's going to be in, in rehab and trying to recover from that. And then um, uh, Chris Gamble, if you would uh, remember to pray for Chris Gamble. This is uh, uh, Brother Randy and Miss Cindy's son. He's had some issues with his heart uh, that they thought, well, it ends up it's more his nervous system that is affecting his heart. And so his, his uh, blood pressure is dropping, and they're trying to figure out all of that. Uh, so if you could please pray for Chris Gamble as well uh, with his, um, his, uh, his nervous issues, his nerve, nervous system issues. Uh, uh, just pray for him that, uh, that he'll get that figured out, that the doctors will get that figured out. What's happening is it's, it's dropping that blood pressure, which is then causing other issues, quite a few other issues, and really they're just trying to, to nail that down. So pray for, uh, pray for Chris. And then I wanted to mention Miss Woodmancy as well. Uh, on July the 28th, she's going to have a pacemaker put in. So uh, please pray for her. That's just a couple of weeks away. Uh, so quite a bit to pray for. Uh, so let's be faithful to pray for uh, our members and then their family members as well. And, uh, and we know that God is in control, and he knows what's going on in each of these situations, and his grace is sufficient. So let's just pray for them. Uh, and I wanted to remind you of those just so I didn't forget. All right, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse 18. The Bible says this, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us, uh, that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth." Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father." And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. God, I do pray that you will be with us this morning. I pray that you'll uh, bless the service. God, I pray that you'll uh, make your word clear to us. Lord, I pray that you'll help me to communicate it clearly. Lord, we do ask that you'll be with the prayer request specifically, specifically that were mentioned just a few minutes ago. God, I pray that you'll work in each one of those uh, individually, and Lord, that you'll be magnified and honored through those. Again, be with us this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in order for us to kind of know really where we are, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. So First John, uh, we're going to go back to chapter 1, verse 1. And what he said there in the first verse, out of, out of nowhere, he just introduces uh, th this book, and he says this, that which was from the beginning. Now, he goes on to describe that which was from the beginning and who he's talking about when he says that which was from the beginning is Jesus Christ. And he goes into the specifics of what he's talking about because he then explains to the uh, little children that he refers to, this early church, that 
uh, that Jesus walked with man and Jesus was God. That's really what he's getting at in the first couple of verses. And he says this, we heard him, we walked with him, we touched him, we saw the miracles that he did, and we got to experience them. So we know Jesus, but you can know Jesus just like we know Jesus. And, and really the whole point of what he's getting started with in this book is this, I want you to know Jesus just like I know Jesus. And the whole reason he's writing this is so that their joy can be full. But in order for us to know Jesus the way that the disciples know Jesus, we have to know about him. And so John immediately goes into this idea that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And so we have this contrast uh, and this separation between uh, God who is light and, and darkness and how they're separated. And, and if we say that we uh, are in the light with him, uh, but we have sin in our lives, then we're liars because darkness cannot be in the presence of light. And so he really differentiates really us from God. And he, he shows us who we actually are and who they were in the early church in comparison to God. And really what that amounts to is this, that they were flawed and that we are flawed and, and we mess up. But I'm thankful that he goes on to explain to us that when we mess up, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So not only uh, is God light, but he also cares about us in such a way that he forgives us for our wrongdoing and he allows us to then have a relationship with him. And I'm thankful that Jesus Christ, and he goes on into chapter 2 and he explains it very clearly, that Jesus Christ is our advocate. Not only is he uh, perfect and holy and just and right, he is one who cares for us. And so Jesus is our mediator between uh, God and man. He takes to the Father, uh, he goes before the Father on our behalf. And, and, and I'm just going to tell you right now, we do not deserve that whatsoever. There is nothing that we can do or that we can be that deserves for Jesus to speak on our behalf in favor of us. And yet that's exactly what he does. He is the propitiation for our sin. That means he is the atonement for our sin. Because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary, living a perfect life, laying down that life and dying for our sins, we can now have a relationship with a holy and perfect and just God. We can know him because of what Jesus did for us. And really, it's just, it's a humbling thought to think that God himself would love us so much that he would die for us so that we could then be in his presence. Even though we are sinners, we can be in the presence of light. And it really is a humbling thing. And really, all of that was said so that we can understand this. We can know God. Now, that in and of itself is humbling. Think about that for just a second. You can know God. You can know about him. You can know his attributes. He wants to know you. He wants you to know him. And it is a possibility. Well, how do we know God? How is it possible for us to know God? Well, John tells us if we keep his commandments. We just do what he asks us to do. And if we do what God asks us to do and we keep his commandments, then we will have the opportunity to know him. Well, what commandments are we supposed to know? Uh, what commandments are we supposed to follow? Well, the same commandments that he gave in the Old Testament, he gave in the New Testament. And it's not a new commandment. It's the same as the old commandment, but it is a new commandment. And if you remember that passage in chapter 2, uh, a couple of verses in, he just goes into the, the, the commandment that God wants us to know is the same that it's always been. And that's this, love God and love one another. And if you obey those commandments to love God and to love one another, then what's going to happen in your life is you're going to know God. That, that's just the result of walking as he walked, doing what he did. Love God and love one another. And you say, well, uh, that was a long time ago. That was very different. In the Old Testament, 
Things are different in the New Testament than they were in the Old Testament. Well, that's why he very clearly laid it out. What's old is the new, and what's new is the same as the old. And the reason that it's the same thing is because God doesn't change. He, he, he has never changed, and he never will change. And so the same God that provided for the people in the Old Testament is the same God that was providing for the early church that John is writing to, and he's the same God that we have today who wants to provide for us. And the reason that God can provide for them in the same way that he provided for the early church and the same way that he wants to provide for us is because he is immutable. He does not change. He never has changed. He never will change. He will always stay the same. And so because of his immutability, we can trust him. We can, uh, we can obey him. It's not something new that just comes up and we have to keep up with the new rules or keep up with the new way of doing things. It's not like that because he hasn't changed. And so then John writes and he gets into some really wordy things where he says, I write unto you, young men, you fathers, you old men. And then he says, I have written unto you, young men, you uh, fathers, and you old. And so what he's saying there is this, that because God has not changed, he has provided and been there for them uh, in the Old Testament for your fathers. He will provide for you now in the early church, and he will provide for everybody going forward. And, and so what John is doing is he is painting a picture of who God is. And so we can know God, but in order to know God, we have to know who he is. And then we have to know that we can trust that he is going to be who he said he was. And he's not going to change. And it almost feels like John immediately goes into left field because he says out of nowhere, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. And so if you're reading through it, it can almost feel like a complete turn out of nowhere. And it can feel like he's just going in a completely different direction. And you might even think, well, goodness, I feel like I got whiplash because he just turned out of nowhere and he went the complete different direction. But he says this, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So he's differentiating love from the world's perspective and love from God's perspective. And when he differentiates these two different types of love, what he's explaining is this. The world's love is that of being enamored or uh, pursuing something. And uh, we related that to dating. And, and uh, I told a, a story about how I somehow, by God's grace, convinced Caitlin to fall for me. Makes no sense. I can't understand how it happened. But it happened, she lost and I won. So sorry, Caitlin. But in that dating, it was me pursuing her. And so I was looking to have a relationship with her. I was chasing her. And so what God is saying, or what John is saying here in his word is this, do not chase the world. Don't pursue the world. Love not the world. Don't chase after it. Don't be enamored with it. Don't, don't, don't look at it and say, I, I want that. I, I want to chase it. I'll go wherever it goes. And he goes on to explain that that's the world's type of love is one that chases after. But God's love is agape. God's love is, is faithful regardless of circumstances. It, it doesn't change. It, it, it's not a conditional love. It's an unconditional love. And so the difference between the world's love and God's love is this. One is always moving, chasing. The other is unconditional and unmoving. And so he goes on to say, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. He goes into explaining how the world system works. The world system is all about me. It's all about what can I get and when you get the new thing, there's something else happening over here. So then you chase over here. And then that dies out. And, 
and something else is popular and something else is famous and something else is something that you can't miss out on. And then when you finally get there, it's over here now and, and you're just running around and trying to chase it and you're trying to follow it. But, but the problem with the world is it's always moving and it's always different. And, and the more that you try to chase it and the more that you pursue it, the, the more that you're going to realize you're never going to attain it. And it's not going to be something that can sustain your life because it's never there long enough to sustain anything. And as soon as you grasp it, it's gone. And as soon as you change your whole wardrobe to fit into the style of the day, and you, you spend thousands of dollars to, to fit in and to, to look cool and to, to, to be, wow, that guy's got it all figured out in the fashion world, you, you open up your social media and everybody's dressing a different way and now you're out of date immediately. And so right when you get there and you, you all of your efforts and all of your time and your, your money was put into to achieving something, it's gone and now you're old and you just can't keep up, and it's frustrating because the world's always moving. And so what, what John is saying is this, don't chase something that cannot be caught. Don't pursue something. Don't live your life in a way where you're only focused on getting something that cannot sustain your life. And he goes on to explain it in verse 17, the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What John differentiates here is this. If you chase the world and you chase the things of the world, you're always going to be left wanting. So chase God because he doesn't move. And the same God that provided for Joseph and Daniel and the children of Israel over and over and over and over and over again is the same God that helped the early church as the gospel was exploding and spreading out and as the persecution of Rome and others were all over it is the same God who wants to help us today because he doesn't change, because he doesn't move. So love him, live for him. And if we love him and we live for him and we abide in him, what happens is we can stand and we can be sustained in an ever-changing world around us. So now John takes some time to talk to these people that he loves. You can, you can hear the intimacy in the next verse, in verse 18. He says, little children. This is not derogatory. He's not trying to say something that would uh, be offensive to a mature group of people. But, but this is from a place of love. He cares about these people. So he says, little children, it is the last time. We are living in the last days. Now, this was a long time ago. And yet John believed he was living in the last days. He believed that Jesus could come back any second. And we have to live for him and we have to tell others about him because Jesus could come back even though Jesus had just left years before. He was ready and living the way that God would want him to live. And yet he says, it is the last time, and as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Now I want to take just a second and, and, uh, and labor on this, because what's happening in this passage is John is giving a little bit of a glimpse into the future. He is talking about the Antichrist in the end times, the one who will stand and, and combine all governments and combine all the financial systems and the one who will stand ultimately opposed to God as the Antichrist. I don't really have to spend a lot of time explaining who this is because we know who this, we know uh, who this person, we don't know who he is specifically, but we know who this person is according to the scriptures. And, and the world even knows. If you go out and you just go to Walmart and say, hey, the Antichrist is here, they're going to go, ooh, that's just, don't, I don't want to talk about that. Even if they're not a believer, just like they know the Antichrist is a bad guy, right? And so he is specifically talking about a specific person who will be the Antichrist someday coming forward. But he also goes on to say this, not only is there an Antichrist that shall come, even now there are many Antichrists. That means that there are a lot of people who are acting the same way that the Antichrist will one day act. And so he reveals something to the church. Now what he's doing is he's giving a warning. 
This is a warning to the body of believers in the early church, and he's trying to explain to them that there are people in the church who are anti-God. Now, this is interesting to me because I want to, I want to continue reading. He said, whereby we know that this is the last time. So we know we're in the last time because there are a lot of people who are anti-God. This is what's interesting in verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. When we think antichrist, we think bad, bad guy, opposite of Jesus. Jesus lived a perfect life. He was all good. He was all love. So antichrist must be all bad, all hate. But what's interesting is this is a mature group of people and we had antichrist in their church and nobody knew. Nobody really could tell at that point. Don't you think it would have been obvious if uh, that person is antichrist, they would have stood out a little bit if they were anti-God and they were the exact opposite of Jesus in a church, the early church that was trying to live like Christ? It's like uh, somebody says, hey, kids, don't run in church. Well, the antichrist person in church would say, hey, kid, run faster. You know, I mean, it would be kind of obvious day by day uh, in the daily church life if that was the, the actual representation. But what we see and what John explains here in just a minute is it's not so obvious. It's not that they are anti-everything that Jesus was. It's not that Jesus was all good so these people are all bad. That's not what is going on here because if that's what was actually happening, it would have been very obvious. These people are not like us. They need to go somewhere else. They need to get out of here. And yet John is writing a warning. So he goes on to say this, they did leave. So they were with us for a while, but they went out of us. And so what John actually does is he separates the early church here in this passage into two groups of people, the little children or who we'll call believers and the antichrist. And thankfully, John doesn't leave this to our imagination. He defines this for us. Look at the next verse, verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. So he talks about the little children first. He talks about the believers first. And he says this, you have an unction from the Holy One. Now, I looked up that word because we don't really use that word very often. And really what he's trying to get across is this, that they are spirit-filled they are filled by the Holy One. The Holy One there is the Holy Spirit who indwells a believer. So when a person realizes that they, that they are a sinner and they are separated from God uh, because of their sin, they have then repented of that sin and placed their faith in Jesus Christ who died for their sins. At that moment, they are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. They, they have the Holy Spirit living in them and they are filled with, with the Holy Spirit. But it, it, it actually goes on a little bit further than that. Uh, because what he actually says, the, that word unction means this. It means an atonement, uh, an anointment. It means that, that uh, it's like a, a balm that's put on a wound. It's an actual, um, it's an actual uh, ointment that is, that is put on to soothe. It's kind of the, the idea that, that, that the actual word means. But... If it goes one step further, it looks like this. If you remember the story of Samuel, when Samuel anointed David as the king, he went to David's house and he talked to the brothers. He was looking for the next king of Israel. He couldn't find him. He had to ask, is there any other son that, that you have, Jesse? And Jesse says, well, there's one more, but he's the runt of the litter, so you, you don't really want to talk to him. But he says, well, bring him to me. They bring David, this little redheaded, ruddy kid in, and he's sitting before Samuel, and God immediately speaks to Samuel and says this, he's the one. So immediately Samuel takes oil, and he anoints David. Now what he's doing at that point is, he is he's basically coronating the next king. He's, he is in an unofficial, it's not, it's not out for the whole nation, but in that moment, in that room, 
what he's actually doing is he is making David to be the king. David, who was once a nobody, is now royalty. He, he's the king. In God's eyes, he's the king. In, in Samuel's eyes, he is the king. And so from that moment, uh, and really even before that and after that, what they would do for royalty is they would anoint. Now, I'm, look, I'm American through and through. We don't do the whole king thing, and I, I'm cool with that, right? I don't really care about that stuff, but we just had the queen pass away over in England, and I hope she knew the Lord, but the new king, uh, Charles, was there was this big old ordeal. I didn't watch a second of it. I don't care. I don't, it's just not for me. And, and really, it's because I love America. I would rather watch a hot dog eating contest on America's birthday <laughs> than watch this guy come in in this huge robe and put a crown on his head. I just don't care. Uh, and, and it's because there's just that, uh, I, I mean, as an American, we're a little bit, we're rebels to a degree. I mean, we, we saw the king and he was doing his thing and we said, we don't like that. We threw his tea in the ocean and we said, get it out of here. You know, it's just there's something in us that, that we just say, you know, we don't like that stuff. We don't want to watch it. We don't want to have anything to do with it. We do, we do what we do. You guys do your fancy stuff over there. And so that's kind of been my attitudes towards it. I don't care about the royal family. I don't care about the drama and all that kind of stuff. I know a lot of people do, and good for you, but uh, whatever. I just, it's not for me, you know. Uh, and we do have our own types of coronation. Now, it's not for a monarch, but if somebody does something and they deserve a medal of honor or something like that, there is a ceremony that goes into place. And, and so we do have something similar. But, but what, what this term, this unction is actually talking about is literally a coronation. And so I had to do some research because I don't really care about that kind of stuff. But what, what, what happens at a coronation is they put the crown on the head. And it's at that point that this person is official. They have the power. They're in control. They're the boss. You know, that's when what they say goes, it goes. That, uh, it's, it, it's the way it's going to be. And so I find it interesting, and we're going to talk about this next week. I find it interesting that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are anointed as royalty. You are made the son or the daughter of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I do get excited about that. That is something that's amazing. And I don't know if I can fully describe what that would actually look like or what that does actually look like, but it's more than just a filling of the Holy Spirit. You are made royalty when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And, oh, it's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. But he goes on in verse 20 to explain what he means by being filled with the Holy One or from the Holy One. And he says this, ye and ye know all things. Now, when you get saved, you're not endowed with some mathematical, uh, you know, knowledge where you know every equation of everything, you know, uh, everything about biology, everything about, it's not that kind of know all things. He's not saying when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have all knowledge uh, possible uh, for man to know. But what he's saying is this, you have the Holy Spirit that lives within you now, and that Holy Spirit enlightens you or it guides you unto all truth. And so he, he's not saying that in that moment you know everything about everybody about everything, but what he's saying is you have the Holy Spirit living within you, and the Holy Spirit will work in your life in such a way that leads you and guides you to his word, and it allows his word to reveal what actual truth is. The, the Bible makes it clear that in order for you to actually understand what the Bible's saying, you have to have the Holy Spirit living within you. And so that Holy Spirit does that work within us. And so he's saying that ye know all things. And it, here's what it looks like. When somebody tells a lie or speaks something that's not true, something within you says, hmm, something's not right. This is what he explains in verse 21. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. When somebody tries to tell you something about God, and it's not true, something within you says, oh, I don't know about that. Well, explain it to me. I can't, but I just know something's not right. It's a little red flag pops up. It's a little light that goes, hey, something's wrong. Don't listen to this. 
And so that's kind of what he's saying is happening as the Holy Spirit lives within you. You might not know the ins and outs of that truth, but what you know is what you just heard is not true. And something's wrong. And you might not know the exact answer of why it's wrong, but something in you is saying, hey, I got to pay attention to this. Something's going on. Now, you can see how valuable that would be if you are in a, let's say, a church setting And there are people in that church setting who look like you, who dress like you, who act like you, who are doing everything that you're doing, but they just believe something that's a little bit different, and they start to say something. It might be good that you have something in you that says, ooh, something about that wasn't right. Because he goes on to explain who an antichrist is. Look at verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. So he goes on to explain what an Antichrist actually looked like in the early church. And this is what they look like. Not somebody who did the opposite of what Jesus did. Not somebody who dressed different. Not somebody who talked different. Not somebody who who walked different. Not somebody who encouraged people to do wrong things. No, no, no. It's simply this. Somebody who denies that Jesus is God. Somebody who denies the attributes of Jesus. Somebody who denies the attributes of God. Why is this important? It's important because if you deny the attributes of Jesus, if you deny that Jesus is God, then our salvation is vain. It's pointless. If you say that Jesus isn't God, but he died for our sins, well, then that means a guy just died for the sins of other people and nothing mattered. He had to be God. Jesus had to be God in order for our sins to be forgiven, in order for the atonement to be made. And so if you deny that Jesus is God, then man, a sinful man, cannot have a relationship with a holy and just God. It cannot happen. And so just something like denying that Jesus is God, that changes everything. It might look like this, that they were maybe not denying that Jesus was God, but maybe that they were denying something about Jesus or an attribute of Jesus. Or, or yes, Jesus did die, but you have to add circumcision to it. And if you're not circumcised, then you can't have a relationship with him. Or maybe it looked like this. Yes, you do have to believe in Jesus, but you have to speak in tongues because that's what shows that you have the Holy Spirit within you. And if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not truly going to have a relationship with God. Well, I'm sorry, but that is anti-Christ because you are denying the very nature of who God is. And so antichrists were not that they looked different or that they encouraged bad behavior or that they didn't live a certain way. It's not what they were. What was happening in the early church and what John was warning against is this, false doctrine. People who are preaching another gospel. People who are changing the attributes of God. People who are, or, or even people who are outright denying that Jesus was God. Or that Jesus was just a good guy and we really have to worry about God. Or it might have looked like this, that we have to um, obey the law and not so much about the grace part. There were so many things that were actually happening during this time. And there was a lot of confusion during this early church where people were trying to preach a different gospel and people were trying to do a different thing. And so John just lays it out here and he says this. It's very simple. Antichrist are people in the, in, among the body of believers at this time who are preaching something than that which you have heard from the beginning. He says it in the next verse, verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. There's two groups of people. There are believers who have an unction from the Holy Spirit. And there were people who at this point had left, who were anti-Christ, who believed a different way. And so John said, I have to give you this warning. Why? Because these people, as they left, were trying to pull 
believers away from where they were. You see, the devil fights dirty. He doesn't, he doesn't play a fair game. And what happened was there were people that they rubbed shoulders with, that they served with, who said, you know what, I just kind of believe this. And then in time, what happened was they separated because you just don't fit. And they walked away. But instead of just walking away, what they tried to do is, what John says in the next couple of verses, is seduce people from the church, seduce the believers. They didn't just walk away and do their own thing and find other people who believed what they believed. They tried to pull away from those little children. They tried to pull away from the believers. And John just said this, look, you've got the Holy Spirit within you. And, and as that Holy Spirit is, is indwelling you, and as you abide with God in that which was from the beginning, here's what you need to do. You need to be aware that there are people who believe differently than you. And when you hear something that a little red flag pops up, you need to be aware of that because even though they were with you at one point, they are not like you because if they were like you they would still be here with you they have been pulled away they are anti-christ so when that little red flag comes up you need to pay attention because there's something going on you know what you believe and you know what is true and if they say that jesus isn't god then they are wrong do not be seduced do not be pulled away do not be intrigued don't even listen to it. You don't need to be taught anything new. You know what God's word says. You know what Jesus did for you in dying for you. You know what you believed when you knew that you were a sinner and you asked him to forgive you of that sin and you have that relationship with God. They're going to sound good. They're going to look good. It's going to make a lot of sense. But I'm just telling you, don't listen to it. You don't need to listen to it. You know everything that you need to know. The Holy Spirit is living within you. So just stand firm. Stay true. And what? Well, he tells us. He just lays it out so clear, and I'm so thankful in verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you which ye had heard from the beginning. Well, what are they talking about? Well, we just spent the whole first two chapters talking about it. Love God. Love one another. Live for him. Don't love the world. Don't chase the world. Don't chase knowledge. Don't chase intellectualism. Don't chase this or that. Don't chase reason. Don't chase uh, the fashions or the fads of the day. Just love God, dwell in him, abide in him, and you will be sustained forever. So just, uh, he said, let, let therefore abide in you that which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, Ye, shall, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. I would say that there were some people who heard this from John and they, they were a little bit concerned. You're telling me that there's Antichrist in the church? Or there's Antichrist that used to be in the church and that they're no longer here? How do I know that I'm not doing the wrong thing? How do I know that I'm not being seduced? How do I know that I'm not being pulled away? Well, just continue in doing what God has asked you to do and just trusting him and just living for him. And in that second part of the verse, he says this, and if, you, uh, uh, if that which is uh, heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. He gives this promise. If you just love God and love other people, the result of that will be this. You will continue in the belief of the Son and of the Father. You, will, you won't mess up. You don't have to be worried that you're going to be pulled away as long as you are just listening to what the Holy Spirit is guiding you, doing what he's asked you to do. You won't wake up one day and say, oh my, I don't even believe that Jesus is God. How did this happen? No, no, you've just been loving God for a long time. You don't have to worry about that. And so John makes a point to say this. Our foundation in everything is based on Jesus being God and doing what he, what he, and believing in what he did for us. So just remain in it and you'll be okay. Don't fall for false teaching. Don't fall for pretty stuff. Don't fall for things that sound good, that look good. Don't look over here because when you're looking over here, you're not looking at the Lord. Remain in him, love him, love others, and you'll be just fine.
love him and love others, serve him and serve others, and you'll be okay. That's what John told the early church. And what's amazing about this is the same thing is happening today that happened in the early church. You say, there's Antichrist in here? I did hear somebody say run in church the other day. I did hear that. I think I heard it. No, it's not like that. But you know what? All over town, you know what's being preached? Jesus only loves certain people. You know, you have to be elect to make it to heaven. That's being preached in Springfield, Missouri today, right now, at this moment. That's anti-Christ because it denies the attributes of God. They are denying who Jesus actually is. And so if we're not careful, what might begin to happen is, well, they make some good arguments. Well, it sounds really good. Well, it does make a lot of sense. Hey, there should be something inside of you if you're a believer saying, oh, something's wrong. There should be a light flashing saying, oh, I don't like the sound of that. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I just know something's not right. When that happens, stop. Don't pay attention to it. Get back in the word and know what God said. Live for him. Love him. And just believe the the clear and simple truths that we find in God's word. And that God who sustained many before will sustain you. And he will be here to sustain many after you. He never changes. He's not going anywhere. So if there's this new idea that pops up that, that says something different than what God's word very clearly says, it's wrong. It's just not true. So what do we do? Just continue in the Word. Just continue to love Him. Just continue to live for Him. Just continue to do what He wants you to do. And as long as we're focused right here and not out here on on crazy stuff that's going around or any new ideas or any new ways of doing stuff or any new worship or any new things like that, let's just focus right here. And as long as we remain in Him, He will sustain us. And we'll just do what he asked us to do. So, be aware. There are false doctrines. There are antichrists in our world today. But if you're here and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have the Holy One who is in you. And when you hear something, pay attention to what he's guiding, to how he's leading to that little red flag that pops up. Mm, something's weird. But look, I really do enjoy this podcast. They're really good guys. They mean well. Eh, just something, something's weird about that one weird episode. Stop. Just stop. Well, I really like his teaching style and, you know, eat the meat and spit out the bones. Just stop. Just stop because what's going to happen is you're going to find yourself focusing over here and you're going to get away from what God intended for you to do, which is what? Love him and love others and just live the way that God wants us to live. I'm just saying it is easy to find ourselves being seduced. It is easy to find ourselves being drawn away. But if you don't want that to happen, just live the way he asked you to live and just do what he asked you to do. Abide in him and he will sustain you. That's it. Well, how do we know that this is true? Because he said it. That's it. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, it is vitally important that you understand that Jesus is God. You cannot deny the Son and have the Father. But I love what he said at the end of verse 23. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. If you want to have a relationship with a holy and just and loving God, there's only one way that happens, and it's through the Son and what Jesus did for us and dying and raising again. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you want a relationship with God, it's through Jesus. That's it. He did it for you. He died for you. All you have to do is accept. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for Your word, God, I pray that you'll just help us to be aware that it is possible for people to believe something different than what your word says. It is possible for false doctrines to creep into our circles. Lord, I'm not saying that there's 
antichrists that are re represented in South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church. I'm not saying that. Lord, I believe that this is a, a church full of people who are believers who have the unction from the Holy One. But God, what I do know is that there are influences all around us that are antichrist and that want to seduce us and that want to draw us away. God, I pray that you help us to get our guard up, to pay attention, to not be easily swayed by flashing lights or intellectualism or whatever it might be. But God, I pray that you'll help us to realize that we just need to love you and live for you and you are everything for us. You can sustain us. You want to sustain us. Help us to abide in you. Lord, I pray that you be at this time of invitation. Lord, if there's somebody who's here who does not know you as their Savior, God, I pray that you'll help them to not deny the Son any longer. Help them to accept and to acknowledge so that they can have a relationship with you. Lord, we thank you for being good to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name.